We have a spending problem. Yes. Correct. Yeah. We've we've um we've never been shy about that. No, no. Uh well we have our we have our Christmas gifts for each other in front of ourselves right now. Uh they're collector boosters. Sam got me the new special edition Lord of the Rings collector booster and I got him a Lost Caverns of Ixalan collector booster. Dianosaurs. And uh, we were like, we can totally open these up on our Monday Night Magic live stream that we stream every Monday night, playing Magic the Gathering. Mm-hmm. Um, one of them arrived today. Today is Tuesday. So these now have to sit and stare at us. Yes. And it's going to be even better because we also ordered a uh, booster box of, uh, what is it, Aftermath? Yeah, Aftermath was like 40 bucks. Yeah, it was like that's like 80 bucks off. Yeah. So uh, we did that. And then over Black Friday, oh, by the way, happy th- happy belated Thanksgiving for all those. Also over Black Friday and Cyber Monday, uh, TCG Player had 10% uh, store credit back on all purchases of anything. So uh, I'm completing several decks and uh, getting a lot of, of staple, like uh, normal things that go in a lot of decks. So I, restru- I, I restructured one deck and I got some upgrades for a couple other decks. Other than that, working on working on uh, making a new deck as well with Ozier Axonil, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. I have I have Endray's Forerunners here, which is the Love budget Crater Hoof Behemoth. Uh, it's probably going to be the only non-elf creature in my Lathril deck now, so that's fun. Also, got a lot of pieces for like Lord of the Non School and all that. But anyway, 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 welcome to this. Our Lord's 56th episode of the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast. I am Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are not, and we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. Yes. I almost, I almost completely fucked that you, one. You reverted back to the old ways. I did. I did revert back to the old ways. This episode, of course, as always, sponsored uh, this time by uh, the new, the new spell in Dungeons and Dragons, Power Word Tickle. Yeah. Power Word Tickle. It's a wonderful seventh level spell there's a lot of those and uh you you basically you basically say elmo you point at someone you say elmo uh and then they laugh uncontrollably and begin to cry as because as the tickling is is unrelenting yes it's uh it's pretty much the same spell as tasha's hideous laughter Mm -hmm. uh except you have to cast it seventh level yeah yeah, you don't get any more targets. Nope. You don't get any uh, any other benefits. No, uh, but it does last um, until they literally pass out from uh, lack of oxygen from laughing so much. Yes. Yeah. So uh, don't cast on a creature that doesn't need oxygen. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the one downside. Uh, but yeah, that's in the new uh, that's in the new playlist. Power word tickle. Thank you for sponsoring the Duels of Mana Dorks podcast. Also, shout out to uh, actual kind of podcast sponsor. Uh, and staved with their wonderful deluxe T20 staff of critical hits that we did a video for, and they sent it to us. It's very cool. Nice, nice little nice little collectible. Big fan. Uh, they technically didn't sponsor the podcast, but, you know, it's still in the document. They so, gave us a thing? There you go. You, you get a free one. <laughs> Have at it. Oh, boy. It's been a week. It's been two weeks, really. It has been. That's, always, we record this once every two weeks. Yeah, I'm fucking ex- exhausted. You were uh, you were out this past weekend yes. at a at a uh, swim meet. Yes, yes, I coach I coach swimmers, and uh, we had a competition, a little travel swim meet down in Louisville, Kentucky. Mm. Oh, Louisville! Uh, one of my one of my boys won high point for the meet, so yay, yeah, yay for him. That was cool. Uh, exhausting. I'm glad that I've got my voice mostly back. Uh, if I didn't, then this would be a lot more painful than it is right now. It's painful for me. Listening to your voice. Everything's everything's painful for you because you have a low pain tolerance. I, you know what? I kind of do. <laughs> I mean, that being said, I, I do have I do have probably over thirty hours of tattoo work on my body, but mm. Mm. I sit very well. As my all my tattoo artists tell me, I don't have to. I, mostly because I don't smoke. Mm-hmm. Apparently, smokers like to take every fifteen minutes to go have a smoke break while they're getting a tattoo. Yeah, that's because that's the only way they know how to relieve any amount of stress. Anyway, Sam, that's me. What have, what have you been playing? What have you been playing since the last episode of the podcast? Let's see. Um, since the last episode of the podcast, I picked up uh, the Talos Project 2 mm. on uh, on PS5. Spatial 
uh, spatial puzzle game. Um, very RPG esque. Interesting. I wasn't expecting that for a for a puzzle game. I mean, every, everything wants to have like RPG elements now in yeah. video games. I, at the, in the first one, they just did it all. It was all pretty much just text based, optional. Mm-hmm. You could read through it. You could pick up some audio logs. But this one's like, nah, you got to talk to the other robots and you have to debate humanity with them. Um, other than that, I've picked up Demon Souls as well. Mm-hmm. And then uh, tabletop wise. Played our second session of Monster of the Week that I've been, that I've started running for my friends. Nice. They finished their first mystery, and no one died. Nice. Yet. Yet. Yes. Interesting. Interesting. I'm still addicted to Minecraft, awaiting Persona Three Reload uh, in January. I think February. February. Persona Three Reload. Uh, I've been having trouble with the remote play functionality on the PlayStation Five. I had I've had to set up like a static IP. Yeah. And shit. It's a whole. It's a whole process. When it works, it works. But uh, when it doesn't work and I'm at work and I need, I have downtime, it's very frustrating. You get sad. I get very sad. I get very sad. Uh, but I, I finally finally got back, uh, not this previous weekend, but the weekend before, playing uh, my Ranger again for my work game. Finally wrapping up a main thing there so we can move on, finally. It's been <laughs> months. Um, yeah, it was good to get back. We did like a little... Our, our DM, he calls it a white elephant. He just buys us a bunch of shit. Hey, nothing wrong with that. Yeah, but you know, some of it's really cool. Like we got little little soap gelatinous cubes with dice in them. Okay, which is pretty cool. I donated that to to someone else. Sure. Um, but yeah, I got a got a whole bunch of cool shit. It's a good time. It was a good time. Uh, my main my main thing. I mean, obviously building all the various decks. Actually, like finishing them uh did some did a trade of an orcish bow masters to to our friend salem got mm-hmm. some elves i got a le- i got the bloodline keeper for my vampire yeah deck, which is you know that's a nice little that's a nice little zhuzh up right there big fan of that um yeah finished the the pdh deck for um for failing leader there's two cards that have arrived today uh that need to go into that with the ethereal armor mm-hmm. and uh there's another umbra as well that'll need to go in there but yeah i'm actually going to finish up my lathral blade of the elves deck finally you've and had that one's you've had that one in in the chamber for several months yeah I mean, it's just it's there's so many options and the cards were expensive and i was waiting for when tcg player had a good deal because i knew the cards some of the cards were a bit more expensive than i would normally go for a deck build mm-hmm. uh and you know 10 percent back on tcg player over black friday weekend was not something i was going to say no to that's fair yeah uh still working on lord of the nazgul i now officially have all the nazgul so i probably can put it into a playable state which is pretty cool uh and then the bane of the soon to be the bane of sam's existence osier axonel first time we're gonna have a proper mono red burn commander that's just gonna fuck everyone up Mm mm-hmm I also want to shout out Loki. Uh, I don't know why anybody like why people don't talk about this board wipe. Like I, everyone's like, "Oh, Wrath of God, all this shit." Uh, Casualties of War, six mana board wipe in Golgari, two black, black, green, green. So you know, limited in its in its color usage. But sure. choose one or more. Destroy target artifact, target creature, target enchantment, target land, and target planeswalker. For six mana, if you're in Golgari, you can meticulously dismantle everyone's board and leave yours completely unscathed for six mana. I don't know. Like, that. that's a good board. Like, it doesn't hit battles. Because it was printed before battles existed. <laughs> and that's kind of all that it doesn't hit. Obviously, it doesn't. It destroys mm-hmm. and doesn't exile, but, you know. How much was it? Uh, let's see. It's not, it's not crazy expensive, either. It's a like casual, like... I always, whenever I, yeah, it's a buck seventeen. I always, yeah. I always have to get like I, I, I love my mana app because it has, because of, of course I always want to know like why isn't this one, why isn't this card good or like wait, it, why isn't it more expensive? Um, Casualty of War, legal in basically every format that it makes sense to be legal in, right? Um, I mean six huh. mana. But that's as an, far as, as board, board wipes, wipes, yeah. Like, that's, a, I don't know. Each permanent is destroyed in order. Abilities won't go on the stack until it's finished resolving. 
You can choose any number of the modes for Casualty of War, but you can't choose a mode more than once. Oh, uh, you can only choose it. Uh, yeah, that would make sense. That would make sense. Oh, yeah, because cards, um, cards do have the you can choose the same mode more than once clause. All right, that's fair. I mean, it's still not a bad card by any means. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so it destroys five things for six mana. But you can hit the five most important things of all types. And a lot of cards don't hit land, so, you know, yeah. if that's if that's what you're in the... Okay, so it's not nearly as big of a bomb as I was thinking, but for buck 17, I'll, I'll take it. You know what? Yeah. I'll take it. I'll take it. But yeah, that's, that's what I'm playing again. What, what decks are you working on? So... Like I said, I upgraded a couple of my decks. Uh, I changed my Captain Engathrod mill deck, horror mill deck, to a Zelix Sandy Thayer, Slayer with Scion of Halaseer background. Um, sure. I really... Mr. Steal Your Stuff as Captain Engathrod uh, really doesn't work as much as I would like it to because we don't always play against creature-heavy decks or, like, big... It would be great against this big stompy he- creature-heavy deck or a big artifact stompy. So I would just re- much rather have a mill deck. Um, other than that... You do love your graveyard quite I do a bit. love my graveyard. Um, I've been looking at building a 12th Doctor deck, mm-hmm. which is a uh, 12th Doctor has demonstrate... Er, it gives every... It gives the first card I cast each turn from not my hand, demonstrate. What does it do? Meaning uh, I can choose to create a copy, and if I do, target opponent also creates a copy. Oh, and whenever you cop- like that. copy like a spell, uh, the tar- uh, the doctor gets a plus one counter. That's that's fucky. I'm not I'm not particularly fond of that. There feel, are there's some shenanigans. There are some shenanigans where you can like copy. Uh, uh, there's one spell in particular that's well, any of the packs where it's a zero cost spell, but then at your next upkeep you have to pay the whatever cost, yeah. usually monocolor yeah. cost, to uh, not lose the game. But there is one spell that says end the turn. You lose the ter- you game at the next at the beginning of the next upkeep. And it's like a three mana spell, uh, or not the next upkeep, the next end step. Uh, that being said, the way demonstrate works is the opponent's copy resolves first. So, cast it, copy it. Opponent gets it. Opponent's spell resolves. The turn ends, removing your copies from the stack. Mm-hmm. Next turn begins. They can't do anything. The next end step comes. They lose the game. I did not include that. I think that's cheap and not very fun. CDH, though. CDH. Anyway, that's all we've been playing. Nothing too crazy. Nothing ridiculous. Monday Night Magic, though. Check that out. Monday nights. We did a little, our live stream, we did, uh, we, we did like a teaching how to play Magic the Gathering using some jumpstart packs, which was pretty fun. Yeah. It went over really well. The audience really liked it. So I'm probably going to do that more often. Anyway. This is, of course, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast. You can get this podcast every other week. You can watch it live on TikTok when we record it on Tuesdays. It goes live on Wednesdays at noon. You can get it on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, or YouTube channel. We also have our TikTok with the Monday Night Magic live streams and our other goofy videos. Instagram, YouTube, Discord, X, all that jazz. Jazz. All that jazz. Upcoming releases in the worlds of D&D and Magic the Gathering, the Book of Many Things. Uh, It was delayed again. (laughs) It was originally delayed uh, back in October um, because of production issues and the quality of the the productions themselves. Uh, Digitally, it came out on time on Halloween, October 31st, but has since been delayed again, uh, still with manufacturing defects and issues, uh, but this time with a set physical release date of January 4th. 2024. Uh, also at Paxton Plugged in 2024, we or 2023, we got two new D and D books announced for 2024. Uh, two adventure books. First one is an up to level 20 adventure called Vecna Eve of Ruin. At some point in 2024, as well as another adventure anthology book, Quests from the Infinite Staircase. Also in 2024. What do you think, Sam? Well. A lot of people have been predicting this Vecna book for a long time uh, because was it, I think it was 3.5, 3, whatever, uh, ended with a, a series of books about Vecna mm-hmm. and coming. And uh, so people are like, hey, we've been seeing things that are kind of pointing to this again. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've kind of been seeing that for a while. 
uh, quest from the in- quests from the infinite staircase. Uh, it's gonna. It sounds like a walking simulator to me. Yeah. Well, I'm, we we've known for a while that the adventure anthology books, um, Tales of the Yawning Portal, Candlekeep Mysteries, um, oh, what was the the city one? Yeah, the multiversal city. Yeah, oh. I'm, it's blanking on me too. Yeah, the they, the anthology books are really really useful as like a little drop in plug and play kind of thing, giving you like a little. One session, three session, whatever, a little mini adventure in your campaign. Those are really useful and just generally fun for more casual D&D. Uh, if they keep up the quality that they've been keeping up with the anthology books, I'm sure it will be good. I'm intrigued by the uh, how wizards would balance an adventure designed for 20th level characters. That's always a, that's always a thing that uh, has been a weak point of of. of adventure books is that the boss monsters are often really bad yeah um and i mean it makes sense because it's almost impossible to predict what a party of anywhere between three and eight people is going to be composed of and is going to have you know what abilities they're going to choose and how they're going to take magic items and stuff like that uh, and what rules they're going to break along the way um that being said obviously the big battle is going to have to be vecna That'd be hilarious if it was just like it's just Dave from HR. Just Dave. <laughs> it's <a> Gary Gygax. <laughs> Gary Gygax is the big bad. Uh, so we'll have to we'll have to see how that comes out. Um, most DMs that we all, that you know you hear of take boss monsters and just redo them, throw them out, mm-hmm. and put something new in. Hard to do with Vecna. Hard to do. Hard to do. Thankfully, uh, we did get a little Vecna supplement with the last Stranger Things. Uh, there was a, a free little monster anthology. I don't even remember what they called it. A dossier? The dossier. Ah, oh, the Vecna dossier, yes. With a wonderful Vecna stat block. That, uh, it's what the Lich should have been. Hmm. You know, Vecna's cool. Obviously, the hand and eye of Vecna and all that. Vecna's... Oh, man, they're, I, I'm intrigued about how they would go about a boss against a party of level 20. Uh, it's the first ever printed official Wizards of the Coast level 20 adventure. So that's exciting. Yeah. We'll see We'll see how that goes. Both of those released again at some point in 2024. In the realm of Magic the Gathering, we've got pretty much all the sets, all the main sets that we're going to know about uh, for 2024 already announced. Ravnica Remastered coming out next year. Thank the Lord. We have an entire month without a Magic the Gathering core release. It's very exciting. Uh, Ravnica Remastered, January 12th, 2024. On my birthday, February 9th, 2024, we're going to have Murder at Karlov Manor. The Fallout Commander decks, March 8th, 2024. At some point in quarter two, we're going to get Outlaws of Thunder Junction, as well as Modern Horizons 3. The Assassin's Creed Universe is Beyond set at some point in July of 2024. Quarter three, we're going to get Bloomborough. And quarter four, we are going to get Duskmorn. So... We, we've talked about these sets at nauseum. I'm not, I'm not super pumped about any of these sets in particular. I'm sure the core Magic releases will be perfectly fine. Modern Horizons three going to get a lot of good reprints. Going to get some good reprints out of Ravnica remastered, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we did we did Dominaria remastered at the beginning of last year. I don't know. If, I don't know how into you are the Ravnica remastered right now. I don't know. I think Ravnica has, uh, has some very notable cards that came out of the different Ravnica sets. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what cards are going to be, what cards they're going to print. Yeah. Um, that being said, we kind of we also when we started playing the, our first set that we were, the first set release that we participated in was Dominaria United. Yeah. So we kind of had a much a much stronger yeah uh, draw to Dominaria. Yeah, Dominaria, and then like immediately after Brothers War and yeah. It's a whole thing. I kind of, I kind of, I'm finding myself that I just kind of prefer, like the planes of existence sets, you know, like mm-hmm. just here's Strixhaven, here's Ixalan, here's Eldrain, and less like here's the story of the Brothers' War, here's the story of the Phyrexian War and the aftermath therein, here's the story of a murder at Karlov, Man- like that kind of stuff, you know. Um, with the exception, of course, being Crimson Val and Midnight Hunt, just because kind of they go hand in hand. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Anyway, the big story, of course, for today's podcast is the newest unearthed arcana for Dungeons & Dragons that has been released. This is 
Player's Handbook Playtest Number 8 for the upcoming 2024 revision of 5th Edition's Player's Handbook uh, for 1 D&D is going to just simply be 5th Edition 2024 revision. It's still kind of annoying that they're not just making it a new edition and making it backwards compatible with 5th, but whatever uh we, at, with the most recent players handbook play tests they've kind of been reeling back in some of the crazier ideas that they have had and refining the class options that we have available to us this uh play test eight we dive back into the barbarian the druid and the monk uh with the barbarian subclass path of the world tree the circle of the moon druid subclass and the warrior of the hand monk subclass as well as introducing some new and revised spells which is also very exciting. Uh, there's also some weapon revisions, revised version of the ability score improvement feat, and some rules glossary updates. So we're just going to dive right into uh, the Barbarian. We're going to just check out the design notes here for the Barbarian. This wonderful addition to the playtest, by the way. It's a mm. little highlighted box of all the yes, design the notes. Yes, the design notes makes it, <laughs> makes it very easy to find what they changed. Yes. Uh, they've been trying to give all of the classes reasons to have a short rest. So now your rage, you get... Uh, we regain one expended use of your rage every time you finish a short rest. They have now replaced Brutal Critical uh, with the Brutal Strike feature. It is a new feature that lets you trade in the advantage granted to you by your reckless attack for various tactical options. There is then an improved uh, Brutal Strike, which expands the options of your Brutal Strike feature at level 13 and level 17. And then Persistent Rage now restores all uses of your Rage once per long rest, and the Unconscious Condition, not the Incapacitated Condition, shuts off your Rage. So it just it, for, it allows your Rage to last longer, harder for it to go down, and you get your, when you're at higher levels, you just constantly have your Rage. Uh, but the big addition here is, of course, the change from Brutal Critical to... The Brutal Strike, which is a level 9 feature. If you use Reckless Attack, you can forego advantage on the next attack roll you make on your turn with a strength-based attack. If that attack hits, the target takes an extra 1d10 damage of the same type dealt by the weapon or unarmed strike, and you can cause one Brutal Strike effect of your choice. You have the following effect options. There are two at level 9. First is Forceful Blow. The target has pushed 15 feet straight away from you. You can then move up to half your speed straight towards the target without provoking opportunity attacks. The second option is hamstring blow. The target's speed is reduced by 15 feet until the start of your next turn. At level 13, you get two new options, including staggering blow. The target has disadvantage on the next saving throw it makes and cannot make opportunity attacks until the start of your next turn. And sundering blow. Your blow leaves an opening for the creature's defense for an ally until the start of your next turn. The next attack roll made by another creature against the target gains a bonus to that roll equal to your rage damage bonus. And then the last brutal strike improvement increases the damage to 2d10 as opposed to 1d10. And you can choose two of the brutal strike effects to use when you use your brutal strike feature. Uh, their whole design philosophy around this was simply... Um, Brutal Critical was built around the idea that it would pair with your Reckless Attack and give you advantage so you had a higher chance of dealing a critical hit, but your Brutal Critical really wasn't something that was an always-on effect. Mm -hmm. And it if you didn't get the luck of the dice, if you rolled advantage and you got a 3 and a 4, yeah. uh, didn't really mean a whole lot of anything. So now you've got options that you can use and for simply foregoing the advantage. You can still get the advantage uh, and have a higher chance at a crit, or if you want to be uh, have a better chance of even hitting the target, if the target has higher AC. But now you've got some various combat and tactical options that you can take advantage of. And they made a note in, uh, Jeremy Crawford made a note in this in the playtest video that they released on, on D&D, uh, the YouTube channel. These pair with weapon masteries as well. Ooh, so you can really apply, nice. you can be applying multiple different uh, combat effects with a, the same strike, particularly at the higher levels when you can apply two of these brutal strike features. What do you think? So uh, that's when we talked about when we made our uh, Bloodcraft and Hemocraft, Hemocraft and Blood uh, supplement. Yes, way um, back, drive through RPG. Way back uh, two years ago now, um, the Barbarian we had a lot of issues with because 
it's so straightforward or the old version was so straightforward it just kind of did one thing mm-hmm. um and that often got boring because i play i tried playing a barbarian once and it was very boring um run up hit the thing run up hit the thing so these do get these do start at later levels which you know uh, might yeah, I I might have I might have liked the idea I like the idea of them starting a little you know giving the uh, barbarian some tactical usage a which, little lower which to be fair you are getting your weapon mastery at level one which is great so that's wow. going to be the main tactical option that you're going to have for your early levels uh, and then once you start to get into higher levels you're kind of getting some more battle mastery type things that also pair with your weapon masteries and I think but I do think. That I re- I really do like the foregoing the advantage because you know once once you're level nine you gotta assume you're gonna have a plus five to your strength mm-hmm. you're gonna have your rage bonus you're gonna have you know whatever your it's plus four I believe at that point for your uh, proficiency proficiency plus, yes yep. plus four so and then you know you probably have a plus one or maybe a plus two weapon. You're not going to, you know, most creatures, you're not going to have an issue actually hitting, even if they have a 20 plus yeah. AC. So to be able to yeah, give you something else to do or help your, uh, help the, the, the rest of the crew in combat is great. Mm-hmm. You are still getting the downside of the reckless attack where attacks against you are going to have advantage. Uh, but I definitely think that the benefits that are provided by Brutal Strike far outweigh uh, the downside of the Reckless Attack. Uh, personally, I would like Brutal Strike being swapped with one of the level 7 features just to get it two levels earlier, either Feral Instinct or Instinctive Pounce. Um, those are just kind of whatever features. Um, but yeah, the Brutal Strike abilities are... Very powerful, and I like that regardless of what you choose, if you forego the advantage, you do just get a, an extra D10 of damage regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big fan of that. These are also things that... Reckless Attack is a very interesting one where a lot of people, a lot of new people often play Barbarians and don't think... They're just like, all right, advantage. You don't want to use that advantage when you're in a crowd. Yeah. You use that on one-on-one, and again... Same idea. You still want to use it one on one only. There's no yeah. point pushing this goblin back 15 feet. Um, Which I will say, the forceful blow, you it push it 15 feet, and then you get to move and forego opportunity attacks. There are situations where that might be able to help you get out of combat in general. It's true. Or put yourself into a safer position relative to where all the enemies are. Um, but but again, this is something that's enabling you to do things like that, which is exciting. Uh, the other barbarian update is to the path of the world tree uh path of the world tree was uh in our estimation a, a pretty powerful subclass and yeah. it reviewed quite well uh in their last playtest survey uh but it does have a couple of changes uh the vitality of the tree now provides temporary hit points to the barbarian branches of the tree now activates at the start of a creature's turn instead of the end of a creature's turn and the range has increased to 30 feet and the barbarian can choose to reduce the speed of a teleported creature to zero. Battering Roots now applies its increased range only during your turn and only for weapons with specific properties. The feature now clarifies you can potentially use two mastery properties in one attack. And then Travel Along the Tree has been redesigned to allow you to teleport yourself while your rage is active, as well as to teleport yourself and your allies a greater distance once per rage so uh the vitality of the tree um you gain the following benefits when you activate your rage you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your barbarian level on top of its normal effect yeah so just generally more um more vitality more juice yes um branches of the tree when your rage is active whenever a creature you can see starts a turn within 30 feet of you you can use your reaction to summon spectral branches of the world tree around it the target must succeed a strength saving throw uh, DC 8 plus proficiency plus strength or be teleported to an unoccupied space you can see within 5 feet of yourself or the nearest unoccupied space you can see the space the target teleports to must be on a surface or liquid that can support it otherwise the target doesn't teleport after the target teleports you can reduce its speed to 0 until the end of the turn uh, they do note that you are able to voluntarily fail a saving throw and the reduction in speed is an option uh, not a requirement so it both has uh, 
benefits to your allies, as well as benefits if you're trying attempting to teleport an enemy. Battering Roots. During your turn, while you wield a melee weapon with the heavy or the versatile property, you can reach with that weapon. Your reach with that weapon increases by 10 feet when you hit. With this weapon, you can activate the push or topple property in addition to any other mastery property that you are using with that weapon, and then travel along the world tree. Uh, while your rage is active as a bonus action, you can teleport up to 60 feet to an unoccupied space you can see. In addition, you can teleport yourself and six million creatures a farther distance. So, I think they just kind of made it better. Yeah. Um, especially that last ability was one of our big issues in the last one. So, we're like, all right. Why would you need to do that? Yeah, uh, level 14, there's better ways to travel the group. Yes. So to be a, to be able to do it while your rage is active um, and mean, bring... A level 14 barbarian now has a 60-foot teleportation effect whenever their rage is active as a bonus action on their turn and, constantly. And they also have a uh, six-creature, 10-feet um, dimension door. Yeah. Which... They get like we were saying, get out of combat, get into combat. Mm-hmm. You you uh, you're fighting something like that get, wants to fly around. Get out of traps, maneuver the entire group, uh, evade certain social situations. <laughs> uh, there's liter- there's a ton of applications for travel along the tree. Uh, battering roots, I think, is very exciting of just being able to activate, push, or topple in addition to any other weapon mastery that you might be wielding. Uh, Just giving you more options and having an increased melee range to 10 feet is ridiculous. Uh, Branches of the World Tree is an interesting little manipulation of the battlefield that you can both use defensively and offensively. And then Vitality of the Tree. I mean, just getting temporary hit points in addition to the regular effect is big fan. Yeah, I'd say this is an upgrade. Massive upgrade. Good job. Very words. Yes, we like the Barbarian. Now the Druid is back. Back again. There's one design note update for the druid, and it is Wild Shape. Now allows the druid to know more beast forms, and it gives temporary hit points to the druid. In addition, the beast form no longer retains the druid's species traits. That was simply just an overlook where they didn't mean to allow the species traits uh, to carry over into the beast form, but that was based on the wording Mm -hmm. you could have. So let's check out Wild Shape. A very simple and straightforward mechanic. (sighs) As a bonus action, you can transform into a beast form that you have learned for this feature. See known forms later. You stay in the form for a number of hours equal to half your druid level or until you use wild chip again, have the incapacitated condition, or die. You can also leave the form early as a bonus action. Known forms. You know a number of forms for this feature equal to two plus half your druid level rounded up. At the level that you get wild shape, that would be three total. Chosen from among beast stat blocks in the player's handbook that have a maximum challenge rating of one quarter and that lack a fly speed. Rather than choosing, you may start with the riding horse, spider, and wolf. Whenever you finish a long rest, you can replace any of your gnome forms with another eligible form. When you gain certain levels, it changes. At druid level four, you can get CR one half with no fly speed. At level eight, you can get up to a CR of one with a fly speed. <sighs> It is effectively exactly. It they reverted it a bit more back to, um, 2014 to the 2014 wild shape. Um, you're still using stat blocks. It specifies stat blocks in the player's handbook, so you are not, you're not. It's not as easily expandable, um, and it forces you to kind of pre-choose what stat blocks you have available to you. Um, I'm okay with that. I I do prefer using the stat blocks over the the like spectral beast form, like the more esoteric ones. Yeah. So if you um, I mean, if you keep reading on the uh, on the wild shape, it does keep stay with the um, uh, keep going down. Uh, da, 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 da. you have your number of uses. Um. Oh, you do also, um, when you assume a wild shape form, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your druid level as well. Yeah, so the game statistics are replaced by the statistics of the beast, but you retain your hit points, hit die, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, class features, languages, and feats. Um, So unless you're playing the moon druid, you're no longer going to be that battle. 
not a wild shape. Yeah. You're going to be you as a wolf with three temporary hit points. Yes, which, to be fair, is much more balanced. Being It able, is. I agree. At level two, being able to wild shape into a brown bear and then assuming all of these extra hit points, um, I think it's totally fair that it also is it, it simplifies the the class when you wild shape is that you're keep you're pretty much keeping all your stats. Yeah. So you're not really changing much. You do just kind of get some new attack options. Uh, you can also not cast spells, but you can maintain your concentration on spells that you already have cast. Uh, but the main updates to the druid come in the circle of the moon druid options. So circle spells is a new feature that provides spells that you always have prepared and you are able to cast in your wild shape form, foregoing the normal restriction of casting spells while in wild shape. Circle Forms, formerly Combat Wild Shape, has been streamlined to determine your AC and the number of temporary hit points that you gain. Improved Circle Forms lets you add your Wisdom modifier to your Constitution saving throws while you are in your Wild Shape form, and then Lunar Form now lets each of your Wild Shape attacks deal extra Radiant Damage. So Circle Spells. At level 3, the Druid has access to Cure Wounds, Moonbeams, as well as a new cantrip, Starry Wisp. Uh, that is always prepared, and you are able to cast those spells whilst wild-shaped. At level 5, you are able to cast Vampiric Touch. At level 7, Fount of Moonlight, which is a new spell in this document, as well as at level 9, you can cast Dawn, also while in your wild-shaped forms. I think that's pretty good. I like that it is a very limited list of options. Uh, previously, they allowed Abjuration spells, which Druid players weren't really ever having to care about the no. the class like the school of magic for their spells uh now this is a much more streamlined option and just having them always prepared is i'm a big fan and i mean the the versatility on those spells cure wounds it's obviously replacing that old feature of the moon druid which was you can spend a spell slot to get, regain uh 1d8 mm -hmm. damage so cure wounds is great now you can also touch your you can boop your uh, your friend with your nose to give him uh some hp back moonbeam giving you a, a range option as most wolves don't have the mm -hmm. ability to do that and uh, then vampiric touch i think is one of the best ones on this list i love vampiric touch like that's low-key one of my favorite spells that nobody ever casts oh yeah i'm a big fan of vampiric touch also starry wisp is a cantrip that uh the druid and the bard have access to which now gives a ranged cantrip option as well so we're actually going to get all the jump way jump on down there to okay i jumped too far into the document you have jumped over all right so starry wisps find it eventually starry wisp evocation cantrip for bards and druids is a cast time of one action 60 feet verbal somatic instantaneous Launch a mode of light at one creature or object within range. You make a ranged spell attack against the target on a hit. The target takes 1d8 radiant damage, and until the end of your next turn, it emits dim light in a 10-foot radius and cannot benefit from the invisible condition. Spell's damage increases by 1d8 at level 5 to 2d8, level 11 to 3d8, and level 17 to 4d8. Just a nice d8 ranged cantrip option. That you can also just cast as a as a bear now. Yeah. I like that both the bard and the druid have just kind of a standard, good, ranged option. Uh, the secondary effect of removing the invisible condition and the ability to gain it is a bit niche. But it is. But. Nothing wrong with that. No. Nothing wrong with that. No. I'll take a D8 cantrip that deals radiant damage uh, any day of the week for the druid and the bard. You get temporary hit points in your circle forms now, equal to three times your druid level, so you're getting a lot more temporary hit points than a normal wild shape. Your armor class, when you are wild shaped, is 13 plus your wisdom modifier, which is, for most of the beasts that you'd be wild shaping into, a 13 plus zero yeah. would be an increase to their AC. So you're getting a massive boost to your AC. Uh, and then the challenge rating, uh, the maximum challenge rating for your forms is now equal to your druid level divided by three. So when you get this subclass, you at level three get access to CR1 creatures, and then that increases at six, nine, 12, etc. And you're getting some really high CR level creatures. In addition to boost to your AC and gaining temporary hit points, um, the improved circle forms, uh, you also, uh, each of your attacks in wild shape deals the normal damage type or radiant damage. You can make this 
uh, designation every time. You can add your wisdom modifier to your constitution saving throws, just generally beefing it up. And then the lunar form, you get to deal an extra 1d10 radiant damage on each of your hits. Uh, and then when you use uh, your moonlight step feature, which has remained unchanged, it's your level 10 feature, uh, you can teleport one willing creature as well as yourself. Uh, they have to be within 10 feet of you, and it has to be an unoccupied space you can see within 10 feet of... There has to be an unoccupied space that you can see within 10 feet of your destination space for that teleportation as well. Um, Circle of the Moon Druid is now more moony yes. than ever before. Yes. And uh, and again, I we know a lot of people who are very dedicated to the Druid. Um, love, love, love the ability to... Uh, just absolutely wreck face with the with the animal abilities yeah being an animal or an elemental as the old uh, moon druid was mm -hmm. um but this being said they are still a full spell caster they are still a full spell caster you get access to casting a limited number of spells while in your wild shape constantly i think the, it's much more balanced now you're still getting significant combat bonuses mm -hmm. just as a wild shaped creature and then also the ability to cast certain spells is Top, top notch. Uh, the other new spell that they introduced you would get access to at level seven is Fount of Moonlight. It is that available? Is a fourth level evocation spell available to bards and druids. Casting time, one action, range of self, concentration for up to 10 minutes, verbal somatic components. A cool light wreathes your body for the duration, emitting bright light in a 20-foot radius, dim light in an additional 20 feet. Until the spell ends, you have resistance to radiant damage, and your melee attacks deal an extra 2d6 radiant damage on a hit. In addition, immediately after you take damage from a creature you can see within 60 feet of yourself, you can use your reaction to force them to make a constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the creature has the blinded condition until the end of your next turn. Um, that's pretty cool. It's not too shabby. Uh, very thematic. Getting an additional 2d6 for all of your melee attacks, uh, particularly in your wild-shaped form yes. is when you would be doing this. And then having a use for your reaction that you can use defensively and it applies conditions to enemies at a fairly good range of 60 feet. As a fourth level, maybe a bit underpowered for some of the other fourth level spells that are available to you, but uh, does provide a lot of extra good utility for specifically the wild shaping druid. Yes. And the fact and like we said, because you can cast it in your wild shape. Yeah. That's 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 not a bad trade off honestly. Not at all. Not at all. Do you have anything else you want to say about the druid? You know what, druid? You're all right. Druid's back. Druid's back. Back again. Guess who's back? Back again. Tell a friend. The boys are back in town. The monk Design updates for the monks. Martial arts sees the return of the monk weapons, and the martial arts die applies to both unarmed strikes and monk weapons as well. Bonus unarmed strike is no longer tied to the use of the attack action, oh. meaning that you can use your bonus action to make an unarmed strike regardless of what you use your action to do. Dexterous attack now allow you now allows you to use your dexterity modifier in place of your strength modifier when setting the saving throw DC of grapple and push for your unarmed strikes. That, I'm so happy. Right? That makes sense. Yes. Uh, sadly, weapon mastery is cut yeah. entirely. I find that to be an interesting choice there. Uh, the monk's discipline, formerly martial discipline, options have been redesigned to have options that don't require spending discipline points, which are formerly key points. Uncanny Metabolism, formerly Heightened Metabolism, moves to level 2, and you regain discipline points when you roll initiative, as well as regaining a number of hit points. Deflect Attacks, formerly Deflect Missiles, now works against melee attacks as well, and the damage of your reaction now includes your Dexterity Modifier. That is a big buff. Oh yeah. Big buff. Stunning Strike now deals force damage if the creature succeeds on the saving throw, so just increasing the potency of Stunning Strike, because that's what they needed. Heightened Discipline is a new feature that increases the effects of Fury of Blows, Patient Defense, and Step of the Wind. Self-Restoration now allows you to remove some conditions at the end of your turn. Deflect Energy now also works against melee attacks. Superior Defense can be activated at the start of your turn instead of using the, an action or a bonus action. Perfect Discipline, formerly Perfect Self, now gives you expended discipline points if you have three or less. And then Body and Mind is now a level 20 feature. That is a lot of changes to go through with the monk. Uh, don't know why they really cut Weapon Masteries. I think that's a bit odd. Um, 
obviously they were kind of giving it to all the classes just to see. Yeah. Like, limiting it to more weapon based martial classes, I get, I guess. But they also made monk weapons a thing again with the martial arts dies. I mean, the monk does already have more option just Floor has more options to do with their attacks on their turn. Um, mm-hmm. And that being said, you can take a feat to get um, weapon masteries. That is true. That is true. Uh, so the main design th- changes that they were looking for with the monk were trying to lessen the the bogged down bonus action economy for the mm. monk. Uh, as well as... Giving you more discipline points and then removing the discipline point requirement from some features that really didn't need it. Yeah. Um, so the big difference, the, the big difference that you'll notice immediately at level two with monk's discipline pertains to flurry of blows, patient defense, and step of the wind. Uh, flurry of the blows is exactly the same as it was. You spend a discipline point to make two unarmed strikes as a bonus action, but you have to remember. You now get a single unarmed strike as a bonus action for free whenever you want with no restrictions. Mm-hmm. Patient defense. You can take the disengage action as a bonus action. Alternatively, you can spend a discipline point to take both the disengage and the dodge action as a bonus action. So you get an option without a discipline point and then a buffed up option with a discipline point. Fury of Blows, you have an option without a discipline point. And then a buffed up option if you do use a discipline point. And same with Step of the Wind. You can take the dash action as a bonus action just natively. Alternatively, you can spend a discipline point to take both the disengage and the dash actions as a bonus action. And your jump distance is doubled for the turn. So, one of my biggest complaints with the 2014 Monk is that if you looked specifically at the Monk and the Rogue, Mm -hmm. Cunning Action would do everything that Step of the Wind and Patient Defense could do for free as a bonus action every single turn. Every turn. Now, you can do the same as the monk, and then instead of having to spend uh, discipline points specifically to do those somewhat basic things, Mm -hmm. you now have buffed up options. And then you even even have that same format for Fury of Blows with the change to the level one just standard unarmed strike that you get as a bonus action. Big fan. Yeah, big fan of that change. Um, it is interesting because, uh, really, um, at least at least not up to this point, we don't really see the the separation of the bonus attack with the from the main attack action. Usually, as it mentions, up to this point, it's usually when you make an attack, you may use your bonus action to make a additional attack, and we see that across several classes. So to actually separate them is very interesting because mm-hmm. now you can do something else on your turn some big thing else uh and then also pop them in the nose yes yes this is probably the biggest change to the monk at level two uncanny metabolism when you roll initiative you regain all expended discipline points when you do so roll your martial arts die and regain a number of hit points equal to your monk level plus the number rolled once you use this feature you can't use it again until you finish a long rest you have effectively doubled the pool of discipline points if you have two combats a day. Yeah, you can really go Nova. It's at starting at level two, and that benefit only gets better the higher level you get, the more discipline points you get, the more options for discipline points that you have. That is a massive, massive, massive buff. Uh, deflect attacks is now level three, or I think it, Deflect Missiles, was it level three? I don't remember, actually. I think it was level three, because level five was Stunning Strike. It was level three. So now it's just Deflect Attacks. You can use your reaction to deflect melee and ranged attacks against you that deal bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. When you do so, the total number, number the total damage you take from the attack is reduced by 1d10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your monk level. If you reduce the damage to zero, you can spend a discipline point to redirect some of the attacks force if you do so choose a creature within five feet of you if the attack was a melee attack or 60 feet of yourself if it isn't behind total cover if the attack was ranged target must make a dexterity saving throw or take damage equal to two rolls of your martial arts die plus your dexterity modifier the damage is the same type dealt by the attack that is just a massive buff oh yeah and now that you're getting a lot more discipline points and not having to spend them as much on other things like patient defense and uh uncanny dot or step of the wind and patient defense 
then you're just going to be able to do this a lot more often, especially now that it's melee attacks too. Oh yeah. The other big the other big update is with stunning strike. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with a monk weapon or an unarmed strike, you can spend a discipline point to attempt a stunning strike. Target must make a constitution saving throw on a failed save. The target has the stun condition until the start of your next turn. On a successful save, the target takes force damage equal to one roll of your martial arts die plus your wisdom modifier. Uh, so the stunning strike is still limited to only once per turn. So we're not going to be overpowering with just four attacks and then four saving throws for five key points. Yeah. And pretty much guaranteeing uh, a stun. Now it's limited to once per turn. It was like this in the previous monk update as well. And you now get a benefit even if they succeed on the saving throw. Yeah. Saver, uh, Saver sucks really stop around uh, for spells you, uh, around level three, there's usually now this clause that if they succeed. So that's nice to see as well. Mm-hmm. Heightened discipline. You now get an improved flurry of blows, step of the wind, and patient defense. Flurry of blows, you spend a key point. Or sorry, discipline point. Sorry. I apologize, wizards. I'm so offensive by using the term key. <sighs> you spend a discipline point and use flurry of blows to make three unarmed strikes instead of two at level 10 for a total of five attacks Mm -hmm. that you're making at level 10 patient defense. When you spend a discipline point to use patient defense, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to two rolls of your martial arts die as well. And then step of the wind. When you spend a discipline point to use step of the wind, you can choose a willing creature within five feet of you that is large or smaller and move that creature with you until the end of your turn. The creature's movement doesn't provoke opportunity attacks. The wording on that Move with you until the end of your turn. So it's not just the extra dash that you get from Step of the Wind. The monk already has a massive amount of movement. You can basically drag someone 100 feet. And you're not provoking opportunity attacks to do so. Just grab your little little halfling, put him on your shoulder, and go. Pretty much. Grab grab your fucking six-foot-seven barbarian goliath (laughs) and carry them on your shoulder. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Self-restoration... You can get that. uh, You can remove Charmed, Frightened, or Poisoned at the end of each of your turns. Uh, You also don't get exhaustion from foregoing food and drink. Uh, Deflect Energy. Your deflect attacks now deflect uh, damage of any type, not just bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. That's a level 13. I mean, body and mind, you you now can increase your dexterity. At level 20, you can increase your dexterity and wisdom scores by four up to a maximum of 26. So much like the barbarian that gets the strength and constitution buff, uh, the monk now gets the dexterity and wisdom buff, which for a level 20 capstone ability, I think is really fucking good. It's it's not flashy. Not flashy at all. What do you think of the base monk updates, Sam? Monk has always had this reputation. There, it, it polarizes the right. It's either people think it's really good or it's really bad. And that's because it's always had a very, it's had a high floor, but kind of a lower ceiling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think with the last update, they really just dropped the bottom out of things. I think they've brought that back up and there are a lot of good updates that they've made to this. Yeah. Even look at something as simple as a level five monk. Mm-hmm. Without a subclass, you're making three attacks per turn just any time you want. For your for your regular action. For your if you're, action. for action, bonus action, you make three attacks. Uh you can dash as a bonus action, you can disengage as a bonus action. Uh all without spending any sort of discipline points. You're able to you to push and shove and use your dexterity. And say your strength as the DC for those. You're deflecting melee and ranged attacks, and then possibly being able to send it back. Yeah. Um, as you react, like you have a ton of options, even not including the normal martial arts die, the normal uh, flurry of blows, the norm like the bo- the boosted patient mm-hmm. defense and step of the wind, the the movement speed increase. I think the floor of the monk has been raised to a point where it's actually just a powerful class yes. option now. We also get the way the warrior of the hand, formerly the way of the open hand. Uh, open hand technique now has the addle option to prevent creatures from making opportunity attacks and no longer requires a saving throw. 
Wholeness of body now allows you to regain hit points without expending discipline points. Fleet step now allows you to take the step of the wind option alongside another bonus action. Quivering palm now allows you the option to replace one of your attacks with the action to end the vibrations on the creature to compensate for this increased flexibility. The cost and damage of the feature has been adjusted. So open hand technique. When you hit a creature with an attack granted by your flur flurry of blows, you can impose one of the following effects on that target. Addle can't make opportunity attacks till the start of its next turn. Push is uh, it must succeed a strength saving throw or be pushed 15 feet away from you. Or topple must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or gain the prone condition. Wonderful little combat utility options mm -hmm. at level three. Uh, level six, wholeness of body. As a bonus action, you can roll your martial arts die. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number rolled plus your wisdom modifier minimum of one. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your wisdom modifier and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. So just uh, just regain a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of extra hit points with no, uh, no discipline point requirement. Fleet step. When you take a bonus action other than Step of the Wind, you can also use Step of the Wind as part of that bonus action. And then Quivering Palm, you gain the ability to set up lethal vibrations in someone's body. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, you can spend four discipline points to start these imperceptible vibrations, which last a number of days equal to your monk level. Minimum of 17, <laughs> as it is a level 17 ability. Vibrations are harmless unless you use your action to end them. Alternatively, when you take the attack action on your turn, you can replace one of the attacks with this action. To use this action, you and the target must be on the same plane of existence. When you use this action, the target must make a constitution saving throw, taking 10d12 force damage on a failed saving throw or half as much on a successful one. You can only have one creature under the effect of this feature at a time. You can end the vibration harmlessly without using an action. Obviously, this is something that you're not going to be, you're probably not going to let happen for days and days on end and set a, like, you absolutely could. I It'd be guess. cool. It'd be cool. It'd be cool if you're like, yeah, I'm going to, it's, you know, it's three weeks out. Okay, I'm going to go talk to this guy. Yeah, I'm just going to bop him on the shoulder. Little, oh, look at, look at you, Mr. Lichman. Boop. And then, yeah, just in the middle of combat. Uh, it does specify oh. you have to hit it with an unarmed strike, so you have to make an attack against it. I mean... If it's asleep, yeah, and you have greater invisibility on, it's a whole. I mean, sure, you're level you're level seventeen. Who gives a shit? <laughs> but at level seventeen, in combat for four key points, uh, you're able to detonate a ten d twelve force damage effect. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. We'll take it, especially because you're gonna have God, how many how many discipline points, and then be able to regain them over. You're gonna have twenty discipline points. Or you're gonna at seventeen when you get it, you're gonna have seventeen discipline points. Like that's gonna be pretty good. <laughs> I think the way of the open hand or warrior of the hand, formerly way of the open hand, is now at a point where it's good. Yeah, it's always else? been. I think it's always been. I think a lot of the monk classes have always or subclasses have always been neat. They've always been like, ooh, this could be. But yeah, I think this this is good. I agree. This is good. More utility. I agree. I agree. The monk, it's in a good spot. I think we're we're noticing a trend here with these with these various play tests. They're really they like we said a lot of them. They just went way. They went hog wild on them, or mm -hmm. they really like just they're like, hey, you know how you like this class? Yeah, I'm gonna hit it in the knee with a hammer, and now it's not going to go to finals. Yeah, yeah. The, that is something that. They did say when they started this whole playtesting operation is that they were going to just go a little crazy and then reel them back in. But they didn't do a very good job of making that abundantly clear. Yeah, I was going to say it took like two or three playtests before they said that in a video. Yeah, in a video and only in that video. That's like 45 minutes long. Yeah. Somewhere in the midst of it. So they probably should have been communicating that better and people probably would have been a lot more chill leading up to this. But we're now seeing the the fruits of all of that as they're reining the classes back in and we're getting lots of powerful options that don't go that don't go too far into the realm of overpowered options that the 2014 player's handbook had. Um and now it just seems like all the classes are going to be fun and powerful, which is what we yeah. want. Having a lot of utility amongst, no matter what you choose, being able to have utility, being able to uh, participate in all parts of the of the game, um, not just you know, not just oh, I only created this character as a skill monkey. I only mm -hmm. created this character 
as a as a tank now or i only created this character to deal damage to one thing okay Mm -hmm. now you have options to go out and you know and help your teammate in combat and actually be a cohesive unit yeah not just four dudes fighting 15 goblins yeah i agree i agree so we got some more spell updates the various conjure spells, conjure animals, conjure celestial, conjure elemental, conjure fey, conjure minor elementals, and conjure woodland beings have been all redesigned to differentiate them from the summoning spells that were featured in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which will appear in the 2024 Player's Handbook. Uh, we're not going to go through all of them in great detail. Effectively, uh, the conjure spells used to summon physical beings that had forms and stat blocks. Now these conjure effects are going to be just that. They are effects that uh, are flavored as Mm -hmm. the various things. So conjure animals is going to conjure um, natural spirits that take the form of a large form of spectral animals uh, and then apply an area of effect. And conjure celestials, you're going to have a couple of options for ranges in a cylinder that you can do. We're not going to go into the details of all of them because that would be a pain in the ass. Yeah, a lot of them. Uh, I do think that this is the right move to make. Uh, the the summon spells from Tasha's are much more streamlined mm-hmm. and just better options for summoning sp- like entities onto the battlefield. Yeah, prior with the con with the conjures from 2014, they were okay. You do this thing, but now you have to go find the stat block, or you do this thing, and now you have to control 17 bats. Yeah. Um. Whereas, like we were saying, the you, summon spell. Okay. And you would get broken options like conjure woodland beans with the pixies yeah. and polymorph and fly and ever, turning the party into T Rexes and all that kind of shit. And then the with Tasha's, you got the summon spells. The summon spells, like you said, are very streamlined. They give you this is your stat block. When you choose it, you have three options for most of them. You can put it. You can use this option from the stat block. This option or this option. Um, they're they're much easier to keep track of, mm-hmm. and they are they are decently effective. They are very they're good they're good summoning spells, and now conjure. I really like having more. Sp- I like that the change they're changing the conjure spells because now you have more options for like area of effect spells, yeah, and like static things that remain on the battlefield or that you can move around. I I love those styles of spells just in general like setting traps Mm -hmm. it's just i preferred that style of spell to summoning so i'm personally a big fan of this change uh there's also a big change to a lot of healing spells cure wounds healing has been increased to 2d8 and the healing improves by 2d8 at higher levels healing word increased to 2d4 and the healing improves by 2d4 at higher levels mass cure wounds deals uh gives 5d8 of healing instead of 3d8 mass healing word 2d4 instead of 1d4 they're just increasing the healing spell options. Yeah, healing has never been super effective in in fifth edition. Uh, oftentimes, it's not even worth healing your your allies unless they're already down, and you just need to get them back up. Mm-hmm. Um, so that might be a this might be an attempt to since you have a lot more of effects, and hypothetically, as we start maybe once they start putting out bestiaries, and we see how the enemies if they're going to change anything with that. Uh, might have more effects themselves to go longer in combat without it being a slog or to be able to use all your things without just dying. Well, and another thing is you run over to a creature, you do 1d8 plus 3 healing. Mm-hmm. The next attack removes that and then some. Yeah. You know, so it's not a very satisfying option. Now it's the healing is better. Uh, you're not going to be using your spell slots as much to heal mm-hmm. as like a cleric or a druid. And then you're going to have your spell slots more available for other options that are more fun for the and game. This is also interesting because we have in previous one in previous updates seen where they very specifically said, hey, we're changing things like Goodberry. And I think there was another one where mm-hmm. they said, we're changing this because of the wording in 2014. It was being abused. So it's like, oh, I take a Goodberry. And the and heal and everybody somehow heals twenty seven points. Yeah, and they're like that was never the intention. Now they're giving us things that are like, okay, this is the intention. Yeah, the intention is you can now use a bonus action at range to heal two d four instead of one d four. I'm okay with that. That's yeah, perfectly fine. So uh, we've already gone over the Fount of Moonlight and the Starry Wisp, which are two new spells that were added for Bards and Druids. There is another new spell that is added for Bards and Druids, and it's a Power Word spell. Power Word Tickle. Power, power Word Tickle. <laughs> Sp- thank you for sponsoring the Duels and Manadorks podcast, Power Word Tickle. No, this is uh, the actual Power Word spell. 
they made. Uh, Power Word Fortify. It is a level 7 enchantment spell available to bards and clerics with a casting time of 1 action, 60 foot range, verbal component, and instantaneous. It's very short. You speak a word of power that fortifies up to six creatures you can see within range. The spell bestows 120 temporary hit points, which are divided equally among the spell's recipients. Pretty good. Pretty good. 120 uh, additional protection from damage at level seven. Yeah. Available to bards and clerics. Sure, why not? More healing options as they are clearly updating all of the various forms of healing. I just want to make a quick check at the cure wounds. It is still plus your spellcasting ability. Bonfire. Yeah, okay. So those are really the core changes that have been made in this playtest. I feel like, yep, that is that is all of the changes. Playtest number eight, Sam, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, I think that it's it's kind of been, my thoughts are going to be the same as we've had for the past couple, and I assume the next, the ones to come. Um, it's nice to see what they're doing. We were we were not very happy with a lot of with some of the changes they made at the beginning, due to this. Uh, let's let's throw things at the fan and see what sticks. Um, but now we're actually getting what we can almost expect to see and hope to see uh, when they print new books next year. Mm-hmm. We still don't have a re- release date for any of those books. We don't, which is a little bit frustrating. Apparently, it's supposed to be in the spring. Hmm. So looking more to Q two. Maybe. Late Q1. Late Q1, early Q2. Yeah, it's a whole thing. But I agree. Uh, one D&D, these playtests, they, the, they have the updated D&D rules in a, in a very, very playable form now. Uh, they've had that for a, little bit, for a little while now, and everything seems to be settling in quite nicely. Can't wait for it all to be compiled into one, one playtest or one book that they release. Yeah. We have a couple more stories that we want to get to. These are clearly not going to take nearly as much time. Uh, in the realm of D&D, Dungeons & Dragons adds two Ghostfire gaming adventures to D&D Beyond. Wizards of the Coast is adding more third-party content to D&D Beyond. Wizards has announced a partnership with Ghostfire Gaming to add two new products to D&D Beyond in the coming weeks. The first being Grim Hollow, Layers of Theris, is available for purchase right now. And... The Dungeons of Drakenheim, a full-length campaign adventure created by the top popular YouTubers, The Dungeon Dudes. It's available for pre-sale for release in December. The location, maps, monsters from both books will be available on D&D Belong, along with feats, spells, magic items, and even crafting options for items. Ghostfire Gaming is an Australian tabletop RPG publisher that has produced several well-received and expertly designed 5e campaign supplements and adventures. Most notable amongst them is Grim Hollow, a horror-themed setting that was originally released with a slew of new subclasses and player mechanics. Ghostfire Games has also teamed up with various creators, including the Dungeon Dudes channel, to bring their Dungeons & Drakenheim campaign to life after the world was featured on the still ongoing actual play campaign. The original Kickstarter for Dungeons Drakenheim raised over $1.2 million in 2021. This marks the second set of significant third-party content to be added to D&D Beyond in recent months. Wizards of the Coast previously released the Taldori campaign setting Reborn by Darrington Press on D&D Beyond, adding additional Critical Role content to the website. In addition to the Critical Role-themed adventures and campaign setting books published by Wizards of the Coast, a press release from Wizards noted that more content from third-party content cr- from third-party creators was on the horizons. Quote, it's incredibly important for us to showcase the ingenuity of the D&D community, and we are excited to share the love of fantasy role-playing with more fans to bring the Dungeon Dudes and Ghostfire Gaming to D&D Beyond. This was uh, Marjorie Lehman, the vice president of D&D Beyond's product and tech at Wizards of the Coast, lastly saying, this is the first step w- and as we've got even more surprises planned for the next year as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Dungeons & Dragons. This whole this whole marketing term of the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons has been said multiple times recently. So yes. This big update to D&D. I think it is very smart of them to be going to third party um creators of Dungeons and Dragons content and we had talked previously about revamping D&D Beyond. This was a long time ago yes, during all the all the various debacles. Yes. Um and revamping D&D Beyond and creating a marketplace option for third-party content. And they're kind of dipping their toes into that, but they're doing it in a much more curated and like artisanal, to put it politely, (laughs) 
a more artisanal way, really going forward and picking out very specific things that are emblematic of the best amongst third party content and making it available at, on D and D Beyond, which I think is not necessarily the most community focused option, but I do think it is a very nice curated option. It's interesting because when we talked about this this uh, last time, it was a miss like the the OGL and Wizard saying, oh, if you make D&D content, well, that's also technically our content. So, you know, we're going to we're going to not take your content, but we could. Legally. But we could. Um, and I think. Honestly, this is not a bad way to move towards what we're going to. What we were, what we, you and I, the very smart dungeon bros, were talking about previously of this marketplace. They're getting big creators on board. Yes, they're getting Ghostfire Games. They have they've they been have partnering with Role. They've partnered with Critical Role for a very long time. Um, and so yeah, to see who else is coming, and maybe yeah, down the line we'll actually see. Okay. All creators, any creators, you know, don't need our, you know, hopefully we don't, we don't go through that whole, when you need our stamp of approval to do things mm -hmm. thing again, but we'll, we'll have to see. Well, I think an interesting model, if they're going to go the route of curating what content is available on D&D Beyond, I think it would be interesting to look at the video game industry mm -hmm. as you have like Sony and Xbox, they're buying and they have their first party developers that are making games exclusively for them. But they also go out and they do funding agreements with third-party developers to make content that is also exclusive to their platform. If you look at like PlayStation and uh, Square Enix with games like Final Fantasy 16, which is exclusive to PlayStation, uh, they do not own Square Enix. Nope. But they get a uh, they've made a monetary agreement where they fund a portion of the game. Sometimes it's funding like uh, marketing and other uh, uh, back-end things that help them out. And then in exchange, the game goes exclusively onto the PlayStation platform mm -hmm. for either a permanent period of time or uh, a temporary period of time. I think it would be interesting for Wizards of the Coast to look at that and go to some of these indie developers, third-party developers, and be like, hey, we're going to throw you $50,000, $100,000, and you're going to release your product first on D&D Beyond for a period of one year. And then you can release it anywhere else or sell it independently or do physical releases or whatever. Um, and, and look at that as, an, as a way to generate more content for D&D Beyond uh, and just D&D in general. And then also uh, enabling these third-party creators to make very exciting things, which is, I think, in retrospect, what they were trying to say when they said when they were uh, announced when they were trying to do like the revisions to the the open gaming license mm -hmm. and be like we want we're going to take more of a cut but we're going to talk to certain larger publishers and set up specific agreements for them i think that that's like in the realm of what they were considering doing uh but instead of like a really dick way of doing it that like uh, looking at the video game industry and the funding options that uh, the platform holders have with the, the developers uh, could be an interesting way going forward and would provide a lot more value to all of those D&D &D Beyond subscribers and then encourage people to maybe re-up their subscriptions after all of the open gaming license nonsense and really kind of right the ship mm -hmm. in some ways. We'll have to see how this develops. Over the next several years. Yes. Uh, next story, though, for Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, there's a new Dungeons & Dragons game in the works at uh, the developer Starbreeze. Uh, Starbreeze is a video game studio best known for its uh, Payday series. Developing a game is now going to be developing a game based on the Dungeons & Dragons IP. Codenamed Project Baxter, the upcoming game is expected to release across platforms in 2026 and is being produced on Unreal Engine 5. While further details on this project are still thin, the studio said players can expect, quote, the signature Starbreeze game cornerstones of cooperative multiplayer, lifetime commitment through a games as a service model, community engagement, and a larger than life experience, end quote, on release. When Project Baxter launches, Starbreeze will act as the game's publisher as well. Uh, Starbreeze CEO Tobias Sogren said, quote, 
When looking at prospective IPs for our future projects, Dungeons & Dragons was always among the top of our list, and I am incredibly happy to announce this licensing agreement. Being such, uh, and also thanked Wizards of the Coast for being, quote, such a great partner. Uh, Eugene Evans, the Senior Vice President of Digital Strategy and Licensing at Wizards of the Coast, added, Dungeons & Dragons has has having an extraordinary year. Are you sure about that? They have turned the ship around. Extraordinary year. I don't know. I'm financially, they're probably having a great year. But I mean, Baldur's Gate three release, so you know. Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, our gaming brands, including Dungeons and Dragons, continue to attract great partners as we execute our plan to grow our digital games portfolio through licensing and development. Our collaboration with Starbreeze is a prime illustration of the strategy. Given our imp- given their impressive games and passions for Dungeons and Dragons, we are confident they will create an experience that will delight fans worldwide elsewhere at the studio starbreeze recently released a free update for payday 3 which into- included two classic payday 2 heists into the game um i never was a uh, a player of payday uh, payday 3 originally released on playstation 5 xbox series x and s as well as p c played payday 2 um you know you know all those indie uh, sim games, mm-hmm. internet cafe sim, and yeah, payday t- two to me felt like bank heist sim, mm. just with a with a slightly higher budget, obviously than an indie game. That being said, it wasn't unfun, but you know, I played it with our with our um, with our PlayStation gaming group, and it kind of got uh, it kind of got boring after a while. Mm. It was one of those that I'm like. I'm sad I paid for this. But that being said, I paid a three. Is game. Well, let's let's see here. Payday three reviews. I don't know any. I don't really know anything. Uh, uh, ooh, ooh. Uh, okay. Steam. It has a six out of ten. PC Gamer. It has sixty seven percent. IGN gave it a seven out of ten. Metacritic for payday three. Ooh, ooh, not great. Uh, mixed or average with a. Uh, meta score of 67 uh user score of 3.1 generally unfavorable Oof. that was released uh, a couple months ago in september that is the pc release let's view all platforms uh about the same yeah yikes all right well payday 2 was well received <laughs> here's my here's my big thing here's my big thing Everyone is trying to throw their hat into the games as a service yeah. business model. Everyone looks at the mil- the millions, if not billions, of dollars that games like Warzone and Fortnite and Apex Legends and Destiny Two generate. We can't have a million games that require your life, yeah, to play. Uh, PlayStation has made a big push for their for a lot of games as a service. They're making ten of them, and they're gonna see which one sticks because all they need is one to stick to make a fucking boatload of money. Yeah, obviously. So, as a service is not a new concept by any means. Software as a service has been a concept for a long time. It's not SaaS, um, but that makes sense when you're like, okay, I'm going to provide my software as a service to this company who does this one thing but yeah when it comes to games like apex legends barely had any any um any presence when it released and it just happened to pop off Mm -hmm. and then warzone kind of followed that up and it's just like that is not likely to happen a lot and we see that a bunch of games just rise and fall over the past several years. I, I, there are some games that you can't that like aren't even in a playable state anymore. Yeah, it's ridiculous. I mean, again, I want to I want to reiterate this quote. <laughs> this is from. This is from Starbreeze Studios. Quote: The signature Starbreeze game. Cor- <laughs> Said players can expect, quote, the signature Starbreeze game cornerstones of cooperative multiplayer and lifetime commitment through a games as a service model. Why do they think they would deserve a lifetime commitment from anybody over any of the other millions of other games as a service models? Clearly, these games aren't going to last forever. 
No. Sure, some games do pop off. Like we said, Apex Legends keeps having updates in the large mm-hmm. player base. Minecraft. Minecraft. For- Fortnite. Th- yeah, these games have been have have been have been cornerstones in the gaming world. Minecraft since 2012, you know, Fortnite since what 2017. Apex since uh, t- early Around then the 19. pandemic. But even the earliest version of Fortnite, the Battle Royale didn't exist. No. It was a single player game. <laughs> like I these Chasing the allure of the games as a service model with a with an expected release in 2026, that is a dangerous proposition to be making. I'm gonna um, figure out this by 2020 uh, by 2024, and that's less than a month away. Yeah, and let's look on the upside here. Okay, D and D as a as an IP is rife with possibilities. It is very easy to make updates for. I could totally see. I could totally see a world where there's a lot of great content for this for this project. Sure. I'm not hopeful. <laughs> last last little bit. This is going to be a little wrap up. Our one piece of Magic the Gathering news. They announced a new banned and restricted list that is going to very notably be changing the game, and it is currently in effect. Uh, Karn, the Great Creator, and Geological Appraiser are banned in both Pioneer and Explorer, and Smuggler's Copter has been unbanned specifically in Pioneer. In Modern, Fury and Up the Beanstalk are banned, and in Popper, my beloved Monastery Swift Spear is banned. I love I love that card. RIP in pieces to the Monastery Swift Spear, specifically in Popper, and all the other formats is still legal. So, yeah, get fucked. <laughs> get fucked. Uh, Popper does not apply to Popper EDH, so nope. uh, keeping it in the third path iconoclast, because fuck you, that's why. Uh, Monastery Swift Spear, I think, was one of the, is probably the weirder one. A uh, one um, one mana one two with haste and prowess is a powerful card, but I don't I don't see necessarily how it's like a format warping card. Obviously, there's a lot of cards that need to like build sideboards around it because it is that powerful. But at the same time, Popper is a format. There's plenty of exceptionally powerful combo decks and card combinations. So I don't. From what I've uh, from what I've heard is that Monastery Swift Spear was is so popular and in, so unanimous in red decks that people were having to build their entire sideboard around it, and uh, you know, it's one card. Man, fuck your shit, fuck your shit. Um, Karn the Great Creator, sure, that was a very powerful card. Uh, Geological Appraiser, I'm not super familiar with. Uh, people are very excited that Smuggler's Copter is unbanned. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was a com- I believe it was a combo piece with... Fuck, I'm not... I don't remember. Oh, I don't it was a combo piece, uh, and both of them were banned, but people were like, Smuggler's Copter wasn't the problem with that combo. It was the other card. Uh, and so now they have unbanned Smuggler's Copter, uh, Copter and Pioneer. Uh, Fury and Up the Beanstalk in Modern. Up the Beanstalk's from uh, Uncommon from Wild Devil Drain. One in a green enchantment where you draw a card when it enters the battlefield and when you cast a spell with mana value 5 or higher, you draw a card. Mm-hmm. Powerful. I don't... Powerful. I guess it's I guess it's bad worthy. I don't know. I don't know why they make these choices, but... Well, and we also don't really play these formats. Yeah. Uh, any formats not listed above, those were Modern, Pioneer... Explorer and Popper remain unchanged. They go into... They are currently in effect as of the recording of this podcast. Uh, In addition, they announced some dates and windows for um, some clarity on Wizards of the Coast announcement dates and windows. The first of these is a, quote, more flexible announcement cadence. First of all, all future announcements to the Magic the Gathering banned and restricted list will occur two to five weeks after each new set's release. This will allow Tabletop Publisher to capture data from large competitive tournaments while ensuring changes can happen before the next set is previewed. In addition, the company has a window following each main set release. The goal is to have most or all of the changes to the standard format happen once per year during the fall banned and restricted window that is associated with the new three-year rotation. This means the next window for standard will be around March 11th following the release of Murders at Karlov Manor. As for Magic Gathering's other formats, these can be updated during any main set release window. They go further into detail regarding uh, those changes on their official YouTube channel. Um, overall, they believe that uh, the current state of Magic's standard format is in a good place, except and the accepted deck styles, aggro, control, combo, etc., are still supported. New cards introduced in Wilds of Eldraine and uh, 
Lost of Caverns of Ixalan seem to have not broken anything irreparably. Don't really care. We don't play those formats. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, we will we will end this podcast as we always do. The Duels and Mandorks podcast, which is available on Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube Music, YouTube channel as well. The Dungeon Bros. We have TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Discord, Twitter. Monday Night Magic live streams every Monday on TikTok at 9 p.m. Eastern time where we play Magic the Gathering. But we end the podcast as we always do with questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, and or ideas from the TikTok live chat as we record the podcast the day before it releases oh live on tiktok sam what do you got uh dan o6 says do y'all have mtg tutorial videos sam was doing a series of learning to play magic the gathering focus mostly on keywords and abilities on cards Mm -hmm. Uh, that being said like we said we did a uh live stream where we talked very in through with through our turns in great detail mm-hmm. uh for one of our jumpstart matches um live on tiktok live for, monday on night, TikTok. for monday, night, monday night magic we do have a camera that we could set up and do like a top down recording of one of those live streams that we could that i could hand off to sam and he could edit up into something we'll mm-hmm. see so we'll see that's that's an idea it's in the it's in the old thinker it's in the old noggin uh if you want to help support that kind of stuff happening subscribing to our tiktok live streams is probably the best way to do that uh that t guy says can you plan out a lawful good necromancer well Hmm. this is one of my favorite questions so uh uh, there is there is nothing technically inherently evil about the necromancer in 5e you're just raising dead things into a state of animation yeah and and they get a bad rap you know it's it's more of a social stigma it's more exactly and I don't see any problem if you know you have consent of the uh, of the person who is dying, or and you're using it to battle the the forces of darkness themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I le- I love the idea of the a, a, a necromancer wizard, maybe not a school of necromancy, but a necromancer mm-hmm. wizard who's got this massive spell book and it's got like loose leaf paper in it all over the place, and it's just full of consent forms. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, you can't you can't do that. Um, uh, actually, yeah, Doug said he wanted to donate his body to fighting the good fight when he died, uh, and he's been doing great for the past three years. So yeah. I've got this bag of holding. His corpse has been in there for six months. Yeah, yeah, it's vacuum sealed, so it's it's totally fine. Yeah. It's not decomposing at an ex- accelerated rate. Uh, I love. I saw a meme recently in this realm where it was like, it was like. Uh, characters at our D and D table, uh, the fighter. I'm here to avenge my brother, who's with me. And it's like you have, you have my the ranger. You have my bow. The the fighter. You have my sword. The necromancer. You have your brother. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. She's like, that's not what I need right now. <laughs> um, Subboy official asks, is Gishath a quote casual commander? Gishath son's avatar. It's stompy. Yeah. It's, it's a stompy format of a, a stompy style of, of deck building. It's it's the dino, it's the, the preeminent dinosaur leader. Yeah. Get some big dinosaurs. Uh, very susceptible to removal. Very susceptible to the board wipe. The, the strategy. And that being said, you can definitely, I think there is probably, I haven't, I've never built a Gishath deck, and I've only watched a couple being played. There's probably, as probably a way... You can obviously ramp out of your mind and get mm-hmm. Gishath out. Or I saw a thing today that uh, said turn two Gishath, and it has to do with a card that came out in the Jurassic Park um, cards, where it, once it attacks, all dinosaurs have a uh, prowl cost of two and a red. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, then you could if you had four mana or two mana on turn two, or three mana on turn two, not hard to do. Yes, you can attack with it and then get out Gishath. Um, that being said, yeah, you can always just play a dinosaur, muddle about for a while, play mm-hmm. another dinosaur. Get out, uh, get out of Signet. All right, it's time to, all right, we've been playing for a while, it's time to win the game. Here's Gishath. Gishath. Mm-hmm. I don't, it would be a little sandbaggy, though. It'd be, it'd be, I think Gishath is a strong casual commander, but I don't, I don't suspect that really anybody would look at you making a Gishath deck and think, ah. Oh, this fucking guy. <laughs> this ends our pod now. Yeah. No. 
no, it's not. It's it's not like a, like an Ur dragon or or something ridiculous like that. Yeah. All righty. Um, or or Joe to the Unifier <laughs> when built properly. The joke there being, I have a Joe to the Unifier deck, and it's kind of sloppy. Um, when we were talking about the new updates to the healing mechanics, the healing spells, Darcy uh, uh, said, finally worth using spell slots to heal, and uh, was very excited. 120 hit points for the f- Power Word Fortify. Yeah. I, yeah, that's temporary hit points, so it would go on top of your regular hit point pool. Yeah, I mean, healing has always been a very underpowered option in D&D, and now it's getting a bit of a buff so that it... it, it warrants more the the spell slot use and it goes farther so you don't have to use as many spell slots mm-hmm. to heal as much so you have those available to do other cool more fun things with all right and last grant chivers says i got the taldori reborn setting and love it been making the campaign for my group yeah uh we've we've did an entire podcast talking about uh the taldori campaign setting reborn and as far as like D and D books go, it's like probably the highest quality. Oh, absolutely! For one of the most reasonable prices, um, I think it's like forty five bucks, and you get a physical hardcover book, and you get the digital copy of it, like emailed to you immediately if you buy it from the Critical Role shop. Uh, it's got beautiful art, uh, very vibrant colors, very thick cardstock. It's well designed. It's very detailed. If you like Critical Role, it's all you could want and more. Wizards should look at that when they when they think, ooh, let's do a premium D and D product. Let's do right. a premium book. How do we do that? That's how. <laughs> anyway, Sam, do you have anything else you would like to say before uh, before we head on out for this episode of the Duels of Manadors podcast? Keep your wits about you, and your pants also about you. They don't have to be on; just near. Just, just around. Yeah, just make sure you always have pants around. Around, uh, that's fair. Because if you're like hanging out in 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 the home, you need your pants nearby for when you get the the unexpected knock at the door from right. like, the water man. Exactly. Or or like the Girl Scouts trying to sell cookies. You don't want to yeah. open. You don't want to open. Don't want to a bunch of. No, that gets no. you on a list. Yeah, you need to you need to have pants on when you're when you're answering the door the the knock at the door for the Girl Scout cookies. Yes. Um, all right. Fuck, I want some Thin Mints now. Or like some Samoas. Samoas want to have coconut in them, don't they? Yeah, they Gross. do. Yeah, they do. They got that shaved cocoa nut. Got that cocoa nuts. Makes me go cocoa nuts. All right, get, wrap us up. <laughs> All right, uh, shout out to the sponsor of the podcast, Power Word Tickle. Uh, the actual one in Staved as well for the D20 staff. The deluxe D20 staff of Critical Hits. It's a cool little collectible you can check them out at stave.com and i will end this episode of the podcast as i always do with one of my favorite quotes from our game nights let's thunder step out of this play step play test picnic let's thunder step out of this play test picnic